me okay? Is my mic high enough? Is that better? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, my name's Justin Raby. Um, I first want to say thank you, Kirk, for, for allowing me this opportunity this morning, um, and to all of you as well, to, to give me this, this opportunity to share with you guys um, it, exactly what it is that God is doing in my life and my family's life as well. Um, I will say that I'm not, a, I'm not a preacher. I'm just a guy who loves Jesus and who has accepted a call, um, and I'll explain a little bit of that here in just a second, but um, I'm born and raised here in southern Illinois. I'm from Benton. Uh, my wife is with me this morning, and uh, we have a little girl, Finley Kate. She's uh, 19, almost 19 months. She spent the night with her, her Mimi and Pop Pop last night, so she's with them this morning. But uh, <clears throat> um, I come from a family who has been in ministry for my entire life. My parents have been in ministry in some aspect for about 43 years. Um, I'm not 43, uh, <laughs> but my whole life. They, they have been in, in ministry, and um, I remember specifically throughout my teenage years and in like my early 20s telling people that I, I've never questioned my beliefs, you know, that's never been an issue, but ministry was always my parents' thing, and as a kid, you get drug along to everything, and you know, you go through the motions, that's not my path, that's what my mom and dad have done, I'm not going that direction. That's just not my thing. And then here at almost 35 years old, God had a different plan. And, uh, and I'm humbled to answer that call. Um, it's been something that God has been putting in the works for about two years. Now that I'm at this point and I'm looking back, I'm seeing how he was putting things together. He was planting the seeds. And then now is the time to go into that field. Um, and a lot of that came because I finally said, okay, God, if this is where you're leading me, I'm willing to do it. And from there, then it was like the floodgates opened and, and we've just been moving. So um, I am in the process of moving into a full-time position with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, so kind of what I want to share with you this morning is a little bit about the organization itself and what my role will look like. I'll be serving here in Franklin Perry and Hamilton counties. I'll be covering those three county territories. And, uh, and I also want to share a little bit about what God has been speaking to me personally, um, just in my individual walk as a follower of Christ. And, and what I believe is something that every one of us in here needs to get a grasp on, honestly. So kind of uh, mix a little bit of all of that together. And as Kirk said, um, sharing a little bit of the process of how... Um, the organization is funded and things like that because we are a nonprofit ministry organization and, uh, and kind of what the, that looks like moving forward. But uh, so a little bit of, of, of FCA, I guess, history, if you will. If you're like me, I had a very small understanding of what the organization um, is and is about um, and how far reaching it is and what all is, is in, in play with FCA across the board. So the, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes organization was founded in 1954, so it's 66 years old. Um, the founder, a guy by the name of Don McLannan, he was paying attention and he was noticing that all of these professional athletes were beginning to endorse things, all kinds of stuff, shampoo and cigarettes and, and all kinds of stuff they were putting their name in their face with and putting it out there for people to see. And so he started asking the question, why aren't these Christian athletes endorsing Jesus? And why aren't they using their platform to share the gospel? And so he started asking, like, how can we get that going? What, what, can, what can I do to make that a thing? And so he prayed about it for seven years before he ever started anything. And after praying for seven years, he and a few other people they birthed what is now the FCA organization. Um, so 66 years later, as of this date, we are now in 92 countries across the world. So it's very much so a global ministry missions organization. Um, we have, as of January, we have just now over 2,000 
1,000 global staff members that are doing basically the same thing that I am and will be doing. Um, as far as actual FCA affiliated huddles and, and groups, things like that, we have just at around 21,000 of those across the globe. And <clears throat> FCA camps is, is a large portion of what the, the organization does. And we're right around 100,000 camp attendees. And I say that just to, to kind of give you an idea of this isn't just your local school meeting at lunchtime once a week type of operation. This is, this is very much so a global missions organization and the focus and the, the, the vision and the mission of the ministry itself is to see the world transformed by Jesus Christ and his church through the influence of coaches and athletes. Um, it's very direct and, and it's, we're taking the, the call of Matthew 28 and the Great Commission and that's what it's all about, going and making disciples. Um, so kind of a little bit of what I want to share in terms of how can that relate to all of us. I, I've been kind of paying attention and, and 2020 has been a weird year to say the least. Um, but I think a lot of good is going to come from this, and I'm sure we've all had these thoughts, probably talked about it. I don't know if you guys have discussed things like that here. But I think it is, and kind of what Shane was just talking about, getting rid of some stuff. And I think across the, the, the globe, but, but here in America, especially in our church culture, we got to get rid of some stuff to really follow Jesus in the way that we were actually called to do it. Um, so I want to take a quick look at, I'll be in Matthew as well, um, Matthew 5. And we're just going to look at verses 13 through 16. And this is uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> He's just gone through the Beatitudes and that whole thing. And then at 13 he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So... I was reading this passage and kind of thinking about, you know, what is this saying for us? And, and here's, here's my takeaway. Number one, I did a little research. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a historian. I'm more of a practical Christianity kind of guy. How can I read this and put it into my life so that everyone else can see that I'm living this out? So at this point in time, Salt was a very valuable thing. Um, the Greeks apparently thought that it had some kind of a divine nature to it. Um, the Romans oftentimes would pay their soldiers using salt. So it was very valuable. Um, so as I'm reading this, I see that Jesus is saying two things. He's saying, one, to his followers, you are valuable. You, because you're following me, you have value. Cut and dry, it doesn't matter what your status is, you have value. And along that same line, <clears throat> in order for salt to be effective, it has to do something. If you leave the salt in the shaker, on the spice rack, it's, it's good for nothing. But when you apply it to meat or to fish or to vegetables, you apply it to something that comes in contact, it brings out the goodness in that thing. Jesus is telling us the same thing, that you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Where you go, where you bring my light, it shines into the darkness. So the same thing for Christians. We have to be engaging in culture. We have to be engaging with people around us, with situations, um, circumstances, in order to be effective, 
we have to come in contact with something just like salt has to come in contact with something in order to be effective. So, and again, Shane actually mentioned something along these lines too that we just go through the motions a lot of times. We become complacent, we become comfortable. Um, it's easy to come and sit in the, the chairs here on a Sunday morning and that be it. But if I'm reading this correctly, Jesus is telling us something different. He's telling us that you have value, you have influence. Now go, use your influence. And, and that's, that's the point I want to make is that it is easy for us as individuals to downplay the level of influence that we have. A lot of times we maybe look at someone who has status and think, well, yeah, it's easy to see the level of influence that they carry. And that might be true, but I would also tell you that you have just as much influence. Whatever your sphere of people is that you interact with on a daily basis is your level of influence, and that is tremendous. Um, obviously, teachers and coaches and athletes in this situation with FCA carry a large level of influence. Police officers, doctors, lawyers know that they have a lot of influence, but so does the stay-at-home mother who is, her sole position is to raise a young child or multiple children and instill in them Christ-like qualities. Um, I don't know if I could find something that is more influential than that right there. But I know I can speak for the fact that sometimes that can be challenging to feel like you're making a big impact. But Jesus tells you otherwise. He wasn't speaking to the people with status saying that they are the salt of the earth, they are the light. He was talking to everybody. And that goes directly to us too. So, I guess I would challenge you today is to, to take a look at where you are in life, what season you're in, what position you hold, it doesn't matter. You have to understand that you carry significant influence because you are a follower of Christ. And in order to be effective, we have to come in contact with things, with people, with situations. But when we are completely kingdom-minded, and that's the key to keeping your mind on things of above. When we start to do that, the fruit that comes out of us is very much so the fruit of the Spirit. And when we come in contact with those situations, those people, that's what comes out of us. Are you the peace in crazy situations in the year 2020 when it seems like everything is spinning out of control? Do you bring the peace and the, the patience into those situations. And that's just a little bit of, of what I feel like God's been telling me in terms of just day-to-day -day operations as a Christian. And I just can't get past the point of we have to start walking in the practical aspects of being a Christian. And we don't have to overcomplicate it. We just have to stay focused on Jesus. And, and that truly is what will bring transformation. So, in that same line of thought, and, and this diagram actually is a little bit of a visual on how FCA goes about that same process in terms of using the influence that a coach and an athlete brings. We understand that, especially in our small communities, that, that a coach and an athlete does carry a, a, a significant amount of influence. And like I said, the vision of our ministry is to see the world transformed by Jesus through the influence of a coach and an athlete. So kind of the way that this is operating, yes, we are in the schools, in the, in the weekly huddles and things like that, um, but there's a lot of different aspects of what the organization does. And the, the direction that we're moving is that we see that the coach even though they're smaller in numbers, they're the ones in direct contact with a large amount of young athletes on a daily basis. So, where yes, we do direct our focus on getting into the lives of the athletes, a direction we're really focusing in on now is to really get into the hearts of the coaches who are leading the athletes. And we want to, we call it the E3 process of transformation. We want to engage with the coaches and the athletes and develop real genuine relationships with them. 
And I know, if I'm not mistaken, Shane talked about relationships last week a little bit. And that's exactly where we're going. As Christians, we have to develop those real, deep relationships. And as those relationships grow, we can move naturally more into a discipleship aspect of things. And that looks like a lot of different ways. And you can see kind of on the, you know, different types of huddles, um, one-on-one -on -one studies, different events, all kinds of things. The, the possibilities are endless. But the idea is to come alongside of these coaches and athletes and not just lead them to Jesus and say, we saved some souls this week. We're good. No, not at all. Now we're going to come alongside them and disciple them and help them to grow and develop in their, their personal relationship with Jesus. And as those relationships grow, then they become empowered to go and do the same thing. It's very much so discipleship multiplication. Disciples that make disciples that continue to make disciples. And, and through that influence, we see the world transformed by Jesus. And that's just a quick snapshot on kind of how the operation of FCA works. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, I had a small idea of what FCA was. Um, I've been learning a lot through my onboarding process these last few months, and I'm really, really excited about this opportunity because I do see the potential of tremendous change and transformation, but right here in our local areas. Um, you know, we do have FCA affiliation. You know, I know Shane is the huddle leader here in Sessor. Benton and West Frankfurt have huddles and things like that. But what I'll be doing is kind of more of the liaison, the, the facilitator of what more we can do, how we can grow this ministry in our area to in turn impact even more and more lives. Um, so kind of the way that this process works, and I know that I mentioned uh, you know, the support raising aspect of that. Because we are a nonprofit ministry organization, Across the board, all 2,000 plus staff members are all 100% donor funded. Um, at first, my thought was, holy cow, that sounds awful. Like, <laughs> God, I know you're calling me into this, but how in the world is that going to happen? I've never done this before. It's foreign to me. Um, since then, my perspective has shifted because, I, I, one, I understand the biblical backing and, and, and the reason why ministry is funded this way. But I'm already seeing how amazingly God is providing. But I shifted my focus from, whoa, that sounds daunting, to seeing what I just said, where 2,000 people across the globe are doing the same thing. And this ministry is thriving because of believers that believe this mission and they're investing in the kingdom of God to allow us to do exactly what I've just explained here. And when I shifted that thought to, man, how am I going to do that? And took myself out of the equation and thought, there's 2,000 people doing the same thing. And God is providing every aspect of the way. And he has for 66 years. It, uh, it gave me a piece about this, this process. Um, so what I've been doing, I'm six weeks into the, the support raising, and as of today, we're about 25% of the way there. Uh, I feel like that's a great start. I have, I have no standard to go off of other than they're, they're telling me that it's a good start. Um, so I've been meeting with a lot of different people over the last few weeks. Uh, I've had the opportunity to share with a few different churches in the area as well. And so what I'm asking of you as, as a congregation here at the Jesus Center. And I would also ask that as individuals and couples that you prayerfully consider um, a partnership with the ministry uh, of FCA for right here in our Franklin, Perry, and, and Hamilton County regions. Um, kind of the way that that works is, if you guys want to go to that last slide, <clears throat> all any donations can be done directly online. I've got a couple beautiful ladies in my life, don't I? Um, 
it can all be done online if, if you choose to do it that way. And, and the website is there. And that's, that's to my personal support page. It's through the FCA website. And it's all, all secure and all that stuff. Um, but in order to maintain a healthy, sustainable budget for the long term, ideally, giving is done on a monthly basis. And it's just, that's just been a, more of a model that, that does allow you to sustain and to continue the ministry. Um, obviously, there are options to do that on an annual or a quarterly basis. Um, and again, on that website, that is all, you can, those options are all there. Um, I will stick around after the service a little bit to answer any other questions or, or give any additional information if anyone would like to know more. Um, but uh, we really can't do it without support from, from fellow believers. And, and I firmly believe that <clears throat> as I've gone through this process, God has just continued to show his faithfulness and his provision. And it just goes to confirm the call. I am stepping into what he truly has prepared before me. And <clears throat> so I, I'm truly humbled to be able to share with you guys this morning. And I appreciate your time in doing this, and, uh, and again, I would ask that you just prayerfully consider partnering with the organization and, uh, and allowing us to do what God has called us to do. So, Kirk, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, and, and I, like I said, I'll stick around, and if anyone wants to talk a little bit more about it, I, I'd love to do that. Thank you. <clears throat>